Welcome once again to the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Two weeks in a row on the Far Post Podcast. Mm. It doesn't appear to be working. <laughs> no. I'm, for anybody, really. It's not working for us. It's not working for the listeners. It's not working for the players, clearly. Mm. Um, but hey, two weeks in a row, according to uh, the 1994 hit comedy Major League Two, that's what we call a winning streak. Not often people will quote Major League Two. <laughs> so good for you. But well that done. is that is a memorable quote. Well done. I, I did have to actually look up whether that was in Major League One or Two. Well I done. also think you can't technically say that till the end of the show because we just started. Have we really won yet? Yeah, the fact that we're here, sitting here, for me, that's a win. Okay. That's like working that's on it, just showing up as the victory, <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Don't even have to sweat as long <laughs> as you went to up. the gym. Yeah, you put your you put your sneakers on. You double tied them. You're ready to go. That's a victory. <laughs> yeah. Now, I won't talk about trying to get to three in a row next week. That's way... I don't want to think don't about the future. Don't push your luck now. Yeah, that, I don't need to do that. Um, we'll see if I'm even here next week. I mean, you just never I mean, know what's going to happen. None of us might be. I'm hosting like my 300 and what is it? 358th show of the Far Post Podcast. I'm Jeff Lemieux. Um, yeah. Boo. Why are I will continue cheering? to boo you. I don't Why know. are they cheering? This whole thing's gone sideways since the cheering started. What have I done to deserve yeah, uh, nothing, the cheering? Nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. We need to experiment. Just Bring just the booze back and see looking, what happens. Just looking for more things to yeah. bond with. But I guess so. Around the table, we've got <laughs> Elizabeth Bahota here. Hello, everybody. Call Conlon. Hi. He's, he's doing pretty well. <laughs> I'm doing great. He's happy to be on the Far yeah, Post I'm podcast doing, once doing, again. Doing great. <laughs> That's the soundtrack to my life for the last five <laughs> weeks. Yeah, <laughs> that noise. And Jason Dalrymple on hey. the soundboard. Do I have to look at the camera? No, uh, look at the camera. Yeah, Show you could just camera. address you the camera, camera directly. Yeah. Right. That's what we're going to do for the rest of the Far Post podcast. Is just look directly, <laughs> yeah. look directly into the into souls of people, the cameras. We, we should, we should, we shouldn't start just scaring people now. Let's, let's, you know. Yeah, this is not the time. People are uh, yeah. emotionally delicate. People we might need careful. that connection, though. <laughs> they might, they might, might need that eye contact as reassurance. Although there's probably most people listening to this, and I was going to say, saying, true. Yeah, I can hear your voices. This is yeah. really you good stuff YouTubers. for the people listening. Yeah. I do like the addition of Luke on the ladder. I like, I like that addition. Nice. Oh yeah! Wow. Luke yeah. Oh whoa! Luke on the ladder. Yeah, I like me. that. I couldn't see him. I like that. We should just do physical references, like yes. just throughout the entire show. Yeah. Visual so that, references. So that, yes. Yeah. yeah. What did yes. I say? Did I say visual reference? I don't know. I don't know. Physical? Maybe you said physical. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Physical. Yes. Let's get all over physical. the place. Physical. All right. Well, uh, look, I'm not. I'm not even quite sure where to start. You just uh, did. You said all over the place with regards to the last weekend's three-two loss to Inter Miami, because as we spoke about on last week's Far Post podcast. It was not only the Revs' fifth straight loss in all competitions mm. in this stretch, it was the fifth straight loss that almost defied logic in the way that it unfolded. And we've mm. talked a few times now about this unfathomable stretch. And this was another one in the way that it unfolded on Saturday to go down to Miami. And we know all of the background. Uh, Miami had not scored a lot of goals before Saturday. And to go down there and not only concede three to that team, but to concede again in the 88th minute to see it end the way that it did after it felt like from the 60th minute on or so in that game, if anyone was going to get a winner, it felt like it was going to be the Revs. Mm -hmm. Then it's Miami who go down and get it. And I just, it's, it's beyond explanation at this point as to not not necessarily how you can go on a stretch like this of of losing five straight games but how you could lose five straight games in this type of fashion yeah yeah i mean it's, it, if they had gone to the first part if they'd gone there and it's banged in a worldie in the 90th minute and like oh you just throw your hands up but it's another weird goal that that's the part that's sort of flummoxing on top of everything else right the performances are obviously hard to explain and the some of the some of the things we've seen are hard to explain. This run overall is hard to explain, but when you drop in these crazy own goals and ridiculous goals we're seeing that are leading to defeats in the 90th minute, it's just a whole bunch of nonsense that I've never, I haven't quite ever seen before. Yeah, I talked to um, Dave Vandenberg earlier this week, and I think the bottom line is, you know, at training this week, they have to work on a lot of different things, but one of the biggest ones is really making sure to close out those games and staying tight in the last few minutes. Um, I know, I think it was you, Jeff, that put out a, a stat that the Revs have conceded three of their four goals uh, in the last four league losses. No, that doesn't sound minute. like something I would have tweeted. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, there's a stat so. out there somewhere. I don't, I don't think that was, I think like that was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that was some other Jamal. Um, well, anyway, I, I, uh, I digress. <laughs> but either way, no, the no. Revs have conceded late very frequently. And whether it's been an own goal, um, kind of an unusual goal, whatever it is, th they need to figure out a way to be better in those closing minutes of games. They have the pieces there. They 
have tactics, they work hard in training, but that's the time where they really need to lock in and start showcasing what they can do because those are there's been a lot of big deciding moments in the final moments of games that's in the last five regular, um, oh, sorry, five games in all competitions. And they need to start being better about that because, you know, if you hadn't had that late goal, you'd, you'd finish the draw, you'd get the point. You might've been able to score late. There's a lot of, a lot of different components and the revs just need to figure out that, that component to stay locked up. They also should, should be conceding less from the start. And that's another issue, but they've been losing games based on those final minutes. Yeah. Now, since you brought that up, I'll jump ahead a little bit because uh, I'm I'm confident that this team is going to figure things out. There is a lot of season <laughs> left in 2022. But with that said, there's no question that this stretch of games has illuminated some of the things that are going to need to be worked on in the coming weeks and months if the Revs want to have themselves in position to be a contender come September, October, November. And number one on the list, I think no question, and it's what the players and coaches have all said as well, you have to tighten things up late mm-hmm. in those games you mentioned the statistic. It's an 88th minute goal, a 90th minute goal, and a 93rd minute goal that the Reds have lost on in three of those five games throughout this stretch. And bizarre goals to be conceding, not just in those minutes, but in the fashion in which they've conceded them. And I know at some point that becomes that can become a mental roadblock sure. because yeah. you get 2-1 or 2-2 into the closing stages of a game, and you can't help but think about the fact that, you know, well, every time we've been in this position in recent weeks, we've kind of let it go pear shaped. Uh, so that's a mental a mental roadblock you got to get past. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's that's the that's probably the start of it. Before anything else, you just have to mentally feel like you're ready for those moments. Yeah, and it'll exacerbate itself on both ends of the field because when you start to not take your chances, then when you start to think about oh, oh here we go again. No matter what stage of the game it is, oh we didn't take our chances. We're not clear in this game. We're not comfortable. Yeah, and then you snowball on top of yourself. That's that's what he's. That's where you have to fall back on the experience that's obviously in this roster and that Bruce you know, wanted to bring into this group um, to be able to wade through this stuff. We, we've heard some of it in the post game, right, with players like Legette and people like that speaking up about this kind of thing. But that's what you're going to have to fall back on because it can, you can only be a little on edge, right, when this, when this type of run is happening. And these were when we all looked at the schedule and thought, well, that's a nice friendly start to the season, sort of work our way through things. And now you're towards the end of that supposedly friendly stage and we're nowhere close to where we thought we'd be. That's troubling. Yeah, one of the points Bruce Arena has made, especially after this Miami game, when it was the third time you saw the Revs concede late in the game, is to say you get to those moments of the games and it's and it's tied, especially when you're going through a stretch like this. Like you said, there's a tendency to want to open things up and push and mm-hmm. say, oh, well, how can we figure out a way to get that winner and get three points? But sometimes over the course of a long season like this, you just need to say, okay, we're into stoppage time. A draw is not the greatest result, but it's something to build on. It's a point. Let's get out of here and move on to the next game. And they haven't been able to do that. Right. In those moments is when it has collapsed. Um, yeah, that can, that can snowball yeah. on top of each other. And you saw, especially on Saturday against Miami, uh, certainly in terms of being a little bit exposed on the counterattack. Every time Miami got out on the counter, especially in the first half, really in the first half, Miami looked dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I get the Revs are a team that the way that they set up, they want to get numbers forward into the attack. You want to attack with that front four of whether it's, you know, it's going to be Books, a bow, heel, you got whoever's on the wings, legit. It was Tristison on on Saturday. And then you want to get your outside backs forward in Dewan Jones and Brandon By, and it was Ryan Spaulding in Miami. And you want to have a team that has that attacking mindset and is bombing numbers forward. But when you have those numbers forward and you give the ball away in bad spots, you got to be able to shut things down in those moments. And on Saturday, the Reds certainly were not able to shut those moments down, and Miami was able to make them pay for it. Yeah, and not only not be able to to regroup, but rash jumping into rash challenges and even further exacerbating the problem, go back to the uh, the own goal, right? And as unfortunate as it was, I think that was a team that was a man down that was completely stretched on a counterattack at the end of the game, and we were all over the place. Like, that's... That's that's the pieces to everyone's point here, right? That that you should be able to fix relatively comfortably. That if if we're all bombing forward, somebody's job has to be to stay home, and we have to be able to regroup. But it really was highlighting that uh, this was it the second Miami goal where we had people diving into the challenges all over the park. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the second Miami goal oh. is the one that kind of stands out to me because uh, I think it's Robbie Robinson gets played into the left side of the box. Four Revolution players kind of swarm to the ball. Mm. And everybody moves towards the ball, and Campana gets left completely alone right. at the back yeah. post. And everyone in that moment, because everyone is sort of, you know, you're in transition and you feel like you're getting hit on the counter, you're kind of panicking a little yeah. bit. And everybody swarmed everyone to the ball and the left ball. everything yep. open. 
Uh, so that's that's something that I'm sure you well, know I'm, that they have looked at that yes, film that video tape <laughs> several <laughs> times Saturday, yeah. this week. Um, I also feel like the Rebs, they they stressed before the Miami game when we I think it was uh, Richie we were talking with earlier last week and he had said it was really important for the group to get the first goal. So when Miami goes out and they score pretty early on, you know I can imagine that there's some flustered emotions. Obviously, Renex gets on the board and that's a big boost, but it, you know it led to like that moment where there's it creates that opportunity for Miami because I th- I think also with like that group in particular and all the injuries the team has suffered this season the the 11s that have been putting out have been different or players who haven't had a lot of minutes in a while and and are kind of still like learning each other's patterns in that sort of 90 minute game setting so I feel like there's a little bit of a learning curve in that element but also I just don't think that the game plan tactically went how they were expecting it from how they started that game in Miami yeah, I mean, that's another, we can point to a million different statistics of what's different this year than last year, right? Yeah. But the Revs last year, 17-0-3 when scoring first. Mm-hmm. They were unbeatable, literally unbeatable when scoring first last year. They've already lost two games when scoring first this year. So that's something that has yeah. been different this year than last year amongst several other things. It's all different and I don't like it. No, it's not. I liked it <laughs> better last year. I like last it. year? Yeah, I, don't I liked like it, it better last year. Yes. Um, to your point, Elizabeth, in terms of having... Uh, somewhat different 11 week to week look no question it's not it's not uh at the top of the list for us because you don't want it to sound like an excuse but you got to get Gustavo Bo back in yeah. the mix you got to get Adam Buxa back in the mix these are big time pieces in the attacking third for this team two of the club's three DPs uh, Adam Buxa because of the suspension and uh, compact schedule at the beginning of the season the call up to Poland he hasn't started a game for the Revs in a month at this point Gustavo Bo has been out injured you got to get those guys back in the mix because you need those guys to be producing for your attack to really be uh, clicking on all cylinders and Jeff to your point there too you take a look at last year and I might have the numbers off the top of my head a little bit uh, there were some way around this like Adam Buxa led the Rose with 17 goals, I believe, in total last season. Gustavo Bo, 16. And those are just in the opportunities that they scored. They both played a really, really big hand in, in creating a lot of the opportunities uh, as well, not only for each other, but other players on the field. So when you're not having those two guys out there, that's a huge portion of the number of goals that the team scored last year. So you're missing out on creating opportunities and finishing opportunities when they're both not out there. Yeah. And again, I'll reiterate, as me- several of the players have said, Yes, that's a big loss to be missing Adam Buxa. It's a big loss to be missing Gustavo Bo. You should have the depth to come in and get the yes. job done. And they've put themselves in positions to get the job done. It's not like the depth pieces have come in and have been played off the park week to week. They've put themselves in positions to get off the field with points, yep. and they haven't been able to do it. So I think that's been the most frustrating thing. Um, that's what Sebastian Legette said after the yeah. game on Saturday was that, you know, it's not like these guys are coming in and they're, and they're getting played off the park. They're putting themselves in positions and they're seeing week after week these just disappointing finishes to games. Um, and the, the last note I'll, I'll have there is, I know it's easier said than done, right? But you're missing a piece like Tejan Buchanan, who played such a huge part in this attack last year. And you're not just going to go out and get a player who replicates what Tejan Buchanan does, right? Tejan Buchanan has obviously this huge up-and-coming attacking talent in CONCACAF, uh, is an up-and-coming talent in world football, really, at this point. Um, But in terms of what Tejan Buchanan gave you in that sort of game-breaking player on the wing, someone who can, you know, to to quote the old, uh, I think it was a Bruce Arena quote about Clint Dempsey, you know, he, he tries crap. (laughs) <laughs> you know, who He goes at guys. He can take guys on one-on-one. He can create something on his own. You're missing that a little bit with, Te- with Tejan Buchanan, obviously, being at Club Bruges now. You've got a ton of attacking game breakers in Carlos Hill and Adam Buxa, Gustavo Bo. But none of those guys are really giving you what Tejan Buchanan gave you. And at some point, I'd imagine that's probably as the Revs get to summertime and are looking to make additions to this team. You're trying to find somebody who gives you a little bit of that, I don't know, that, that little attacking swerve that Tejan Buchanan Yeah, the, tr- the tricky part is that it's it's hard to replace. Um, he didn't, like Tejan didn't come in as that player. He grew no. into that player. You don't have a DP slot to go get a ready-made player like that, so it's hard. It's a tough one to replace. Um, and Bruce, may, that might be in the plans going forward. It certainly didn't appear to be the plan this offseason with the players he brought in. Right, there was a different kind a of... A bit more thing. of a system shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A system shift. We shored up, brought in different types of players. But, yeah, it's harder to add that piece in um, when you can't go and get a DP, right? That's the tricky part. So, um, yeah, but these are all challenges, again, to get back to where we were. These are all challenges we knew. We're all challenges that Bruce was aware of and the coaching staff were aware of, and they've adapted to. We just haven't 
finish these games. That's yeah. yeah, it's you can go back to we keep going back to the Pumas game and talk about how great that performance was, right? So it's that's what the same roster, yes, injury suspensions happen, but that style of play is, is what this team should be producing every week or at least some version of it. Um and we've just sort of not we, we haven't been able to finish the job here. We've gone to sleep in different patches of the games and look really, really ragged, which is the troubling part. We look we look completely ragged at times. That's the good news is that should be easy to fix because that should be just, <laughs> you know, a mental readjustment and a mental sort of get back to basics. I, I know they've been trying to do that, but that's that's the good news for me is that um I don't think it's look, I'm not I'm not yes, am I worried? Sure. Um is it Smash the panic button time um, almost. <laughs> did I ma- did I maybe do it Saturday potentially, but yeah, it's uh, it, they'll figure it out. I think too. You look at this roster and you do have your your players that like you know. Um, I guess Darius is coming on the podcast shortly, so he'll mention <laughs> some of the guys that he's played with. But you know, you have some of the veterans on the team like Andrew Farrell, who's been here for a long time and has gone through a lot of ups and downs. But when you look at this roster, for the most part it has a lot of players that haven't been through a stretch like this with the, with the revs in particular. With the revs, yeah. yeah. So I feel like you're going to have some of those players like, like let's look at like Henry Kessler as a, an example, you know, a regular starter um, hasn't really gone through a patch of a, of a longer losing streak. And so I think some of it is going to be learning f- how to negate that, especially having a losing streak under Bruce arena, who's, you know, the winningest coach in MLS history, led them to a supporter shield last year. Um, I think it's going to be learning how to kind of take those downs in stride and use them as learning experiences you know you can take those single losses from last year that they had and the revs they did they learned from them but I think the the big um, thing for the refs to take out of this when they do snap snap it and turn it around is that they don't want to go through it again and so figuring out how can they productively use this losing portion this losing streak to uh, channel and fuel the results coming up so um, I think some of them are going to have to kind of figure that out because they haven't done that before um, especially under Bruce and in Foxborough so once they do that I think it's going to also give them a lot more confidence moving forward because I think that confidence right now is what's going to be a big big shifter you play in this league long enough you're going to have stretches like this yeah unfortunately the only way to gain that experience is to go through stretches like this and the revs are certainly going through one right now and Cahal, you mentioned you, you're not smashing the panic button yet but maybe just you know you're keeping it nearby it's just there. in case them reach. but and it's funny because I think when you look at the reaction to this five-game stretch in New England compared to looking at some of you know, the national MLS media, it's a divide that you would expect, right? In New England, a lot closer to smashing the panic yeah. button because that's part of the beauty of the New England sports landscape. Any professional sports team, if you're the Bruins, the Celtics, the Sox, certainly the Patriots since five games is like half your season. If you lose five straight games at any point in your season, people are going to be calling oh for yeah, heads. Yeah, like that's smash. the way it works. I mean, look, we saw it, we saw it with, this, with the Celtics team oh a yeah. few months ago, right? People wanted to, yeah, want to blow it wanted up. to blow that whole thing up, fire the coach, split up the Jays. This thing, they can't win. They don't know how to win. They're terrible. Get rid of them. And now they're, it's a little different, right? Now it's a different expectation for that team. Um, it'll flip again if they don't win in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, it'll course. flip again. You lose one game, that's that. Yeah, and it's so, but again, it's I, I don't criticize any single fan of our team that wants to that wants to rail on it. I don't. It's it's it should be better. They expect better, and the right to expect better. And this is not up to anybody's standard. So, I it's never I, I wouldn't criticize anybody for taking shots. As part of your job as a fan, go for it. And five game losing streak should be treated with the contempt they deserve. Yeah, if you're gonna play professional sports <laughs> in the Boston, yeah. New England region, and you're going to lose five straight games, it's you're going to hear about it. And that's fun. And your, I mean, your other option, right, is to play somewhere where they don't care enough to right. get on you for losing five straight games. This right. is a much better option. Right. Uh, so it is it is every right of every New England sports fan, certainly every Revolution supporter, club, you know, supporters who've been following this club since 1996, when the team goes through a stretch like this, you know, clubs yeah. should hear about it. That's Absolutely. the way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's funny kind of seeing the knack. It feels like the national sports media is t- taking a little bit of the longer view and saying, look, this is, when you look at this roster, when you look at the pieces that are there, this team's going to be fine. They're going to figure it out. This is a playoff team that's going to be in the mix come October, November. Like, that's where the national media is. And I agree with that, but I also, being yeah. gr- I born and bred New Englander, I'm also inclined to be the guy who panics after Yeah, and there's, ex- there's examples all through MLS history, right, with this playoff format of teams sort of you know, getting off the slow starts or having big dips in form and getting into the playoffs and, and doing their job, right? So that's, we, we see that a lot in the league, and that's the beauty of this sort of format, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't have the the passionate connection. They're, they're lucky they don't have that sort of 
wake up and live and die for the team thing, right? So it's it's much easier to be to stand back and go, well, yeah, it's it's Bruce Arena and it's Carlos Heel and there's a lot of talent and they'll be fine. It's a long season, don't worry. It, it's easy to say when yeah. you're not living it every day, right? You're not you're not coming out every home game and hoping it turns around. You're not tuning in every road game and hoping it turns around and say, well, this will be the game. This will be the game. This will be the game. Yeah, it's it's easier to stand back and <laughs> just let it happen. I mean, that'll be fine. Well, I think too, you know, uh, you're bound to lose games. Obviously, this is a as an unusual streak uh, given recent history here. But if you're going to take a look at a 34 game season, would you rather lose five games towards the beginning or five games as you're leading up to the playoffs? You know, I'd rather the, never lose five in a row. <laughs> well, that that wasn't an option, Kahal. There was no write your own option for C. But uh, you know, you want to be heating up as you're going into the playoffs, and that's the time where the team that's the hottest usually gen- generally goes the furthest. You look at like eh, eh, playoffs, March Madness, anything like that. That's kind of how it works. So. Um, I would rather lose the games now if we had to pick between those two and hopefully they figure it out. And then towards the end of the year, they're going into playoffs just on the a really long winning streak. Yeah, apparently there is a an old Bruce Arena quote where he said, in Major League Soccer, the second half of the season is the season. Yeah. And there is a lot of truth behind that now. Of course, the flip side of that is all of the points that are dropped now are affecting you throughout the course of the season. Like there, there is that side of it as well. But it is also true that if your options are struggle a little bit earlier in the year and figure it out or struggle right before mm-hmm. the playoffs are coming around, this is the better option. At least right now you got what, 20, you got 28, 20, yeah, 28 games left, 27 games left to figure things out. Um, so you've got time, but the first seven games have really illuminated a lot of those yeah, things. And, that's, it's, and again, I think what separates this makes it a little different is that it's not just struggling or a slow start. It's, it's a, it's a five game losing streak. Like it's significant. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the, the sort of, yeah, if you if you dropped a couple of points here and there, and if you looked a little rusty, and that would be one thing. It's just sort of when when it's five games, it's like, oh god, I get it. And as again, many I'm as not, they lost last year, it's a not, lot. Right, I'm not I'm not panicked. I get it, and I think they'll be fine. Totally, they'll be fine. All those points are true, but it can also be true to be freaked out by a five game losing streak yeah. at any point. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, it's interesting you brought up that uh, Bruce Arena quote because I just remember last year when the Revs were doing so well that. Uh, we kept asking Bruce what he thought of the team's first, you know, first half of the year, and he kept being like, "Well, you know, we're n- we haven't really started the second half of the season, yeah. or do you be in the second half of the season?" He's like, "The last third is the part yeah. that really matters." He did the move most. the goalpost quite a bit. He, he did move the goalpost a lot on that one. Well, not exactly like <laughs> that. <laughs> well played, Jado. Um, well, hey, you want a bright spot from Saturday? No, please. Let's talk a bright spot from is Saturday. Is it the wedding? Justin, <laughs> the, the wedding. I'm sure the wedding was fantastic. Wait, can I can I interrupt before we do this? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'm. Did sure you go to the wedding? I I tried, but it, I couldn't crash it unfortunately. But I did have a conversation with my boyfriend and my parents about if they could name all five Spice Girls. Neither of them couldn't. But when I asked my boyfriend, one of the answers he gave me was spicy. I spice. do like spicy spice. Yeah, I like <laughs> that. <laughs> and I was just dying laughing. It was so funny. She what was a sick Spice Girl. Yeah, he was like spicy spice. I was like spicy spice is not a Spice Girl. <laughs> what I found fascinating is that listening back to it, Kahal, you might be one of the only people on the planet who very quickly rattled off the five yeah. real names of the Spice Girls, but couldn't name the actual <laughs> five Spice Girl names. <laughs> you knew all of their real names, first that was and very last, impressive. but didn't know all of their Spice Girl names. Oh, wow. yeah. You're like Emma Barton's Baby that. Spice yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Jerry yeah. Halliwell. I'll never forget it again. Yeah, that's ginger spice. Never forget it. For some, I was doubting myself too. I had it in my head, and I was like, for some reason, that yeah. just doesn't sound right. And I was like, so that's why I tried to kind of sneak it in, like, well, ginger spice is going to be that. Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you were right. You got it. I didn't want to sound stupid, ginger. but you were the smartest one in the room. You remembered. Apparently, as I typically am. <laughs> um, no silver lining on Saturday. I think pretty clearly the performance of Justin Rennick. Podcast bump. It's it's exact, the podcast exactly. Bump. Yep. Justin Rennix, next time we want him on the show, just say, hey, last time you joined us, you That's how we need to start pitching goal. this ass to the players. Say, look, yeah. hey, come on the show and you'll play well at the weekend. It's a bump. It's a fact. Yeah, there is a science yes. to it. It is proven. indisputable. It's proven, yes. I'm sure we could go back to, like, Ema had a couple good goals and assists last year. Maybe we need to check out when he was on the show. And I did the research. I went back all the way to the start of the show, and every time we've had a player on, they've been brilliant the following game. Then they just need to come every on. Every single it's, time. It's yeah. factual. It's yeah. science. We so hyped. We had Matt Turner on the show at one point and now he's going to Arsenal. Right. So you're welcome. <laughs> it's like what what else do we need to yep. do to Bar prove to people? Bump. Yep. It's it's a real thing, man. You know? Oh, that's so funny. That's how it works. Um but yeah, I, I will say a little disappointed that in the post game press conference, Justin did score his first goal, did do the post game press conference, did not answer a question yes. 
no thank you. You let us down. So sort of yeah. let me down a little bit there. Um, but yeah, Justin's a player who, from the day he was signed back in January 2019 to that first MLS regular season goal, 1,178 days, and he kept his head down the entire time. A lot of ups and downs for Justin Renex over the course of that stretch to be bouncing back and forth between he went on loan to North Carolina in the USL Championship, spent a ton of time with Revolution 2, you know, constantly every day coming in and not necessarily knowing whether you're trained with the first team or Revolution 2. He kept his head down, and if nothing else, that kid has worked his tail off for the past four years, and it was great to see him rewarded the way that he was. A good Saturday. goal, too. It was clearly great talent finish. there. Yeah. Great finish. Talking really, really well. Yeah, Good I mean, run across his defender. Yeah, really good goal. Really good goal. And the timing of it was huge, too. The Revs needed to bounce back quickly from that first Miami goal. I think uh, having the confidence after something like that, too, to be able to kind of make that impact for the team is big. Actually tough to forget, or tough to, yeah. I guess it is easy to forget based on the way it played. Justin Rennick's goal actually opened the scoring. And then Miami scored two goals yeah. right after oh, that. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Renix did score the opening goal of that game, but then within 10 minutes, the Reds were down 2-1. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they weren't able to turn that opening goal into the positive momentum that they wanted to. Uh, but it was it was a big goal the moment it felt like, especially after Miami had hit the crossbar. They hit the post, like the sixth minute of the game. felt like they were on top. Renix come down, gets that first goal, gives the Reds a little bit of a bump. Yeah, I fully, and just expe- immediately I let fully it expected away. us to, to just push on and cruise on that game. Yeah. Ropey start, settle down, get a goal, and like, okay, let's right the ship now. And it just could not have gone worse in the other direction. It was a meltdown. No, but Justin really taking advantage of the opportunities that have pre- been presented him over the course of the past couple of games. Uh, he's gone out, and, and again, he's just, in this type of stretch, if you can get a guy out there who you know every minute he's on the field is going to work for you. Yeah. He's that, can be, that can be yeah. really important, yeah, and he's work, doing his that. His work ethic should be infectious. I mean, and it really should. And we've seen his work ethic out of training, too, just with the effort that he's putting in. I don't know if we can talk about that or not, but, you know, just yeah. being out of training, we've been able to see this week that he's putting in effort. We just saw him score uh, an incredible bicycle kick <laughs> at training, which I wish we had footage right now to share with you. Um, but I think just that confidence that he, I feel like he's always been a player that's had confidence, but seeing how he takes those moments in stride, like getting the goal in the game, it might have been a loss, and it, w- it wasn't how he wanted that game to play out, but then taking that into training and being excited, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing his development continue over the next next uh, couple years. I'm really hoping that we're able to grab the drone <laughs> footage of that Renex bike because it's a it's a goal that maybe last week he doesn't even try, but the fact that he went out last weekend, got the start in Miami, yeah. scores that first goal, wins a penalty. That's incredible. Maybe, maybe that leads to that confidence to try that bike. And Are we he, talking Agudelo levels of bike? It was a really, really solid good. bike. <laughs> it was really, really solid connection, like full sidewinder. Uh, the yeah. people who were out at training on the side were comparing him to Juan Agudelo in that moment. Me- and also we're saying, you know, it would have been pretty cool if on the drone footage you could have seen him, like, wink as he scored. Like, you know, look <laughs> yeah, up, kick, <laughs> wink. <laughs> might have been. Might I only saw it the one time. I only got the one live yeah. viewing of it. It might have been a bit more of a sidewinder than, like, the full bike. I don't think you should ever watch it again, then. You should keep the memory you have in your mind. Oh, it was beautiful. Don't, I mean, don't dilute it with facts. <laughs> it was beautiful. Keep that in your mind. Don't dilute it with facts. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Can you go you drive around a sticky note for yeah. us? <laughs> yeah. Far post apparel. That should be, don't dilute it with facts and just put our logo on the back. <laughs> yeah, we've all got <laughs> these the lovely t-shirt. little memories in our mind. Let's <laughs> yes. just live in yes. bliss and yes. believe that that's facts, reality. Facts be damned. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Justin Rennix was our guest on last week's show, as we mentioned, and uh, I am very excited about our guest on this week's show. It's a it's a throwback, throwback, a throwback to a uh, an older time in revolution, simpler land. times. Joining us momentarily via the phone by via the phone lines. Do we have phone lines? Uh, we are. On, we, <laughs> do, we do, and they're hopping. That's why yeah. Luke's on the ladder. He's keeping an eye on the switchboard. <laughs> Joining us momentarily via technology. Yes, will be former Revolution defender Darius Barnes. Joining us now on the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League, a longtime Revolution fan favorite, now former Director of Business Operations for Charlotte FC, and newly named President of Charlotte FC's MLS Next Pro Team, which will begin play in 2023. (laughs) Darius Barnes, President Barnes, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Jeff? Yeah, so, not too bad. We have to. I think we have to address you as, as President Barnes now, right? Mr. Is that how you Mr. are addressed President. around the office, Mr. President? Uh, it's, I know. I've been getting it a lot. It, it still feels a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of rolls off the tongue, though. President Barnes sounds like a really official, classy name. Uh, it's a little too official. I'm not that classy. I'm not that classy. <laughs> 
at least a little. Anyone that knows me well knows I'm not that classy. <laughs> everything, everything seems to be going well professionally for you. Everything going well, just in terms of it's been a while since we caught up. Yeah, everything's great. Uh, it's been it's been running running rampant over here. Um, you know, it seems like I, I can't believe it's been this long since I've you know stepped foot at, at Gillette Stadium and, and played on that turf. But um, you know, the, the the end of the road comes comes for everyone. So. You know, I've been fortunate enough to, to transition well and still stay within the game and stay with, um, stay involved with the league. So you know, it's been fantastic. Just continue to help the, the sport and the league grow. Yeah, your playing days didn't end all that long ago. You were with the Revs, what, through 2016, played one more year with the New York Cosmos. So you, you only retired yeah. like five years ago, but you've had, I think it's like 14 jobs since then. <laughs> <laughs> Just, honestly, for, for fans who don't know, you've had quite the journey through the, the business side of, of Major League Soccer. Just take us through your post playing journey since you retired just about five years ago. Yeah. It's, has it only been five? It seems like 10, <laughs> 10, 10 at this point, <laughs> just what, I mean, if you just think about just how, how much the leagues, you know, continue to change and grow just in that five year span is um, it's been amazing to see. And just seeing it from the other side, um, other side of the white lines has, has been remarkable. Um, you know, as you mentioned, 2016 was my last year, last year with the revs, um, you know, my, my contract was up and, um, just chose to, to pursue, you know, other opportunities and, you know, eventually landed in, in ASL with, with the New York Cosmos, you know, in, in the back of my head, I, I pretty much knew that was going to be the end of the road for me. Um, so just took that year in 2017 to start to prep and, and really figure out what was next for me. I always knew I wanted to stay involved with the game. Uh, I wanted to, you know, be back involved with, with MLS and just, you know, everyone just, has just seen, like you said, how the leagues continue to grow, just, you know, both on and off the pitch, just the talent that's coming into the league and, you know, just from a revenue generation side, seeing how the league is growing. So that, that was really what kind of perked my interest, just understanding the league from a commercial sense. Um, obviously, you know, for the past, you know, 20 years of my life, I really understood the, the, the competitive side and the technical side. So for me, just kind of wanted to add a little couple tools to the toolkit and figure out the business behind the league and what really drives it from a from a commercial sense. So 2017, um, you know, I was playing with the Cosmos. I'm, I'm in New York. You know, I set up, you know, some informational interviews and go to the league office just to pick people's brains and really learn just really what drives the league. What, you know, I had no idea, you know, all the different roles that, you know, take place behind the scenes, whether it be in, you know, commercial partnerships or marketing or community relations, uh, the media digital side of things. So really just pick people's brains all across the board and, I was fortunate enough just to continue to create some some great relationships where, you know, when I retired in, in 17, officially hung up the boots, um, you know, I was afforded opportunity in the league office, um, the partnership marketing department where, you know, I really just started to learn from the ground level up, uh, just, you know, working with our commercial partners and managing some of those relationships and the assets that commercial partners really value, um, you know, in, in their agreements with the league. So that, that's really where, where it took off for me. Um, just tried to get in, you know, similar, you know, as a player, just, just put your head down, you know, and, and start at the ground level and try to build your way back up. So I um, was fortunate enough to, to work my way through the league office in a couple of different roles um, in the partnership marketing department. Um, you know, I ended up managing the likes of, you know, Adidas and Audi, MGM, SeatGeek, um, Johnson & Johnson at the time, you know, just a, a number of our commercial partners. And, you know, for me, being in that space, you know, it was afforded me the opportunity to really learn a lot because, you know, in, in partnership marketing, and corporate partnerships, you work with every single department. Um, you know, you really can't get anything done without, you know, understanding the digital media assets that that partners are utilizing, you know, the community initiatives that they're looking to utilize, you know, working with broadcast. So um, just afforded me an opportunity to really learn a lot at, at one time. Um, and then fast forward. To the pandemic, um, obviously, it's a tough time in the industry and in sports. And, you know, you know, you guys can attest to this, just how challenging it was during that period um, to really just to keep the league afloat and figure out how, how to progress forward. Um, and just, you know, that was an amazing time for me just from a learning aspect. Um, that was that was one of the most challenging <laughs> periods of, of, of my life, my professional, obviously, the short, you know, you know, post playing transition, but just in, in general. Um, just kind of figure out, figuring and navigating that space. And um, just personally as well, just going through some life changes at the same time and, and really figured I wanted to get back, get back down closer to family. Um, and me being from the Raleigh, North Carolina area um, is really kind of stars aligned with Charlotte FC getting pushed 
2022 after they're originally supposed to come into the league in, in 2021. Um, and just had some conversations and, you know, really, like I said, that the stars just align, had opportunity um, where there's mutual interest in me coming to help build and, and, and join the club and, you know, obviously build a club right here in my backyard was opportunity I couldn't pass up. So um, worked with at the, our president at the time, Nick Kelly, to come down here to be the director of business operations. Um, fast forward a year later, uh, starting building building another team in, in our next pro team starting in 2023. Simple as that. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> you say I think that's all the time we have with Darius Martin. No, no, no. <laughs> we got. I mean, we got a big picture there, Elizabeth. It sounded like you had uh, a follow up. Yeah, Darius. I I know it's been quite the journey, and you've accomplished so much in sh- such a short period of time. And I'm wondering. As a former player, what was the most important thing that you learned that it takes to be successful on the business side of the soccer operations over the last five, six years? I think the, the most important thing is just to to stay humble and enjoy the grind. You know, for me as a rookie, when I came into the Reds in 2009, you know, I was a, I was a third round draft pick. Um, you know, many people didn't give me a shot to, to make the roster and you got to have a little bit of little bit of talent but a lot of luck as well um and i was fortunate at the time when i came in with the revs that you know there was a need in my position you know and stevie stevie nickel and paul gave me an opportunity um and i tried to do the most and, and you know really kind of take that opportunity by the horns um and i was fortunate to, to make the roster um and just really putting in the work and doing the grind you know fast forward you know nine years later after making my professional debut to, to retiring um, and you really kind of get you get chopped off of the knees and you're, you're back at the bottom of the totem pole. And so you just for me, it's just taking that same mentality to every career that you have. Um, you know, I had to start off at a very entry level position when I was um, when I transitioned from playing. But you just try to learn, just try to learn as much as you can. You know, when I was playing, I learned as much as I could from from the veterans and, you know, take the same in whatever career that you, you know, you choose to partake in after, whether that be, you know, on the commercial side or being an agent or going into journalism broadcast, you just learn from those that are around you and kind of take all those things that you learn and make it your own. And in addition to trying to learn an entire new industry, it's also a pretty big lifestyle shift going from being a professional athlete to being someone who goes in and works in an office every day. So I'm always interested in kind of hearing about that transition from someone who spent nine, 10 years being a professional athlete. And that is a grind every single day, but it's a different kind of grind. You know, you're, you're at the training center, maybe from 9 a.m. to 12:30, 1 p.m. It's, it's just a different schedule than coming into an office all day, every day. So what was that transition like for you? Man, that's, that, that's probably one of the most challenging to be honest, just, getting in that, that rhythm and that grind of, of a nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven, nine to <laughs> yeah. nine. The hours don't at end. some <laughs> points in times, I remember my first couple of weeks at the, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So like my, my first couple of weeks at the league office, I think it, I, I'd eat lunch um, and I'd be ready to take a nap. I'm like, where are the nap pods at? Where can, <laughs> where, where can I go to, to get away? Because you know, after training, you get on, you do your recovery stuff, you do your normal tech, your game ready, you could take a nap on the training table, but you know, once you once you eat lunch in, in the in the corporate world, it's you're you're right back to the grind of it all. So just you know, get getting your your body back accustomed to that. Um, you know, also just having to fend for yourself. You don't have all these meals planned for you. You don't have workout routines planned for you. So had to figure out a way to not pack on too many pounds. You know, once you retire as well, and make sure that you're kind of taking care of your body and trying to you know trying to live as much of an athlete lifestyle as possible. But it's it's impossible to say the least. <laughs> I mean, we, you get a uh, respect for us who work in the office. We're just like athletes, too, just in a different <laughs> way. Different kinds, yeah. <laughs> no nap pods, though, just like, just like this kind of nap pod. Yeah, you just crawl oh, underneath yeah. the desk. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the bag under eyes. It yeah. becomes a fashion statement yeah. in the office, right? Do the George Costanza. Just sleep under your desk for a little while. <laughs> Darius, what kind of president do you want to be? Are you going to be more the um, hands-off, stay-out-of-the-way president or more the Jerry Jones, get in the locker room, pick the team type of president? No, no, I mean, I, I am a Cowboys fan, but I'm going to have to say I'm going to be more hands, <laughs> hands off than, than Jerry Jones, you know. I think, you know, for us, like, what we've tried to do here in, in uh, Charlotte FC is just, you know, bring in good people. Um, I think once you get you get good people in the building, um, you know, the rest kind of takes care of itself. You just want to build a good culture and have people who, you know, you know are, are passionate about, you know, building the club and building the game and helping everyone get to where they want to go. You know, everyone has personal and professional goals. And, you know, if you're all communicating and on the same page, 
you know, you can all help each other kind of rise, rise to the top and get to where they want to go. So that's been our main focus, just getting good people in the building. And, you know, we listen to all ideas that are on the table, um, whether you're entry level or, you know, Nick Kelly, CEO, you know, over both Charlotte FC, Panthers, Bank of America Stadium, you know, just having that accessibility and not having to one, you know, sit too high on their throne um, has really, has been really beneficial for us. So, you know, we try to be as, as collaborative as we can be. You get one perspective coming in and working for an established MLS club, but it's totally something different to come in and build a club from the ground up, like you mentioned you've done in Charlotte. So what was that process like coming in, joining a team that at that point, you know, you don't have a roster, you don't have sponsors, you don't have a jersey. You're kind of you're starting from scratch and you have to build this entire culture, this entire club. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things you don't know what you don't know. I had no idea really what I was getting into. And like when you you, know, you go through the honeymoon phase, you're just like, wow, you get to start something and build a club. It's a, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. So those first two weeks are, you know, you're, you're, you're at the top of the mountain, high of the highs. And then the real work <laughs> sets in and you got to figure out, you know, you're talking about training facilities. You're talking about I'm building fan culture, building traditions, you know, being in the marketplace. How do we continue to just build on the momentum that we had before the club got pushed back to, to 2022. So um, it's one of those things where like, I'm just having the people in the office who are willing, who want to do the work and are passionate about it and, you know, rolling up sleeves, you know, we had, you know, a president at the time, Nick Kelly was, you know, helping, helping put on streams for our caddy matches. Cause you know, at the time we're, we're selling, we're selling fairy dust, you know, when we're going out to the marketplace, you know, like we had nothing to hold on to. We have no, content really that you know that we can go out to present to partners and you know partner prospect and you know fan prospect at the same times you know we had everyone rolling up sleeves um doing doing all the dirty work so i think that's the just the mentality that we have to have is just there's there's no job too big for anyone and just making sure that we were connecting with with the community as well um, especially just during the challenging times that we were coming out of um still just coming out of now just understanding that, you know, how our community initiatives were starting to, to, to build out and then plan out and making sure that everyone knew that we weren't just a club that was, you know, going to play in 2022 on, on Saturdays. But, you know, we were a club that was going to be prevalent, you know, 365, 24 hours a day. What's the most rewarding part about that process, about selling the ferry dust and now finally getting to see uh, how it's come to life and kind of sparked in the city of Char Charlotte? I think the, the the best part is just the communal aspect of it and just seeing how, you know, we're, we're a few games in now and just even just seeing how, you know, how we've grown from, you know, match one to, to match two to match three to match four. Um, you know, it's it, it's you know, it, there was nothing more rewarding than, you know, get three points with, with your teammates, you know, on the pitch. But this is a, this has been a different feeling. It's been very kind of satisfactory um, satisfaction and, and rewarding, you know, you know, this past weekend we beat beat Atlanta one nil at home, and just seeing how much went into those matches behind the scenes to uh, make sure that was experienced that fans could could really rally around and enjoy. Um, it's just a it's a different gratifying feeling than than getting those three points, but it's just as rewarding. Did you allow, afford yourself a minute to step back and sort of take in that home opener and what, what sort of an event and experience that was? Yeah, I mean, you have to, you have to, it's one of those things, you got to, you got to celebrate your wins, you know, it was something that was, you know, been in the work since 2019, um, you know, like I said, setbacks, um, you know, a lot of changes, you know, there's, you know, there's, it's always a bumpy road, ups and downs, some turmoil, highs, lows um, to, to get there, but, you know, like I said before, you just kind of em embrace the grind, embrace the process, and and roll with the punches. So it was, you know, I stood, I was still pitch side, you know, on, on March 5th, just to take in every single minute of that match, because it's, it's, it's something unique. Like I said, it's something that you don't get to experience. Um, so it's a once in a lifetime opp opportunity to, to build a club and actual take part in an inaugural uh, home match. So, you know, I definitely tried to soak it in and enjoy it. And then afterwards, you know, the next week we're, we're back to it, just trying to figure out how to put on 16 more of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know Taylor Twelman was in town for the game that went over Atlanta this past weekend, and he mentioned on the ABC broadcast that being out in the community, it felt like the Charlotte FC team has already been part of the fabric for 20 years or so in the way that they're kind of spoken about in the sports media and the way they've been embraced by the community. What have you seen in the early going in the ways the community has embraced the team and having grown up in North Carolina, did you always feel like that possibility was there? 
Yeah, I mean, if you would have asked me, you know, when I was growing up, if you know the Carolinas were ready for for an MLS franchise, I would I would have said no. But you know, the 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 basis has always been here. The foundation's always been here, and that's you know in the community, and that's you know the grassroots. You know, youth soccer in in the Carolinas has always been prevalent. There's so much young talent here, so the opportunity was here, and just with MLS. Uh, MLS's fan base having such a, you know, just being such a young demographic, um, the, the opportunity and potential was there. And I think it's something that we've tried to lean into um, and tap into. And so you, you definitely get that vibe. You feel that vibe, you know, you know, all the different neighborhoods around Charlotte that make up Charlotte. You, you have this young demographic that's very vibrant um, and, and super engaged. And, you know, you're walking around South End, you're walking around Plaza Midwood, um, this cer- certain neighborhoods in Charlotte, and you're seeing you know, Charlotte FC kits, you know, left and right. And that's something like cool, cool for me to see. You know, I never saw that growing up, just people representing MLS clubs um, you know, within your community. So to have that support, you know, of the community and people actually looking forward to it. And, you know, you're going in bars and restaurants and seeing Charlotte FC merchandise and memorabilia uh, kind of all over the place. Um, it, it's definitely rewarding. It's something that, you know, that you know, we can continue to build on and something that, that, that really represents us well. Did you have an MLS team growing up that you cheered for? Obviously, you didn't have a team in the Carolinas. So geographically, was there a team that you had growing up? Not not really. I mean, the, the closest team I was growing up was, was D.C. United. And obviously, you know, I followed them, you know, early years, all their early success, um, you know, with, you know, Eddie Pope was, you know, a big idol of mine. So so followed him, you know, followed Marco Echeverri, um, just some of the success that those teams had. But I, I wouldn't say I had an MLS team. Um, and so that's the unique opportunity, you know, that we have now just for these young kids actually grow up, you know, with the team to idolize, with players to look up to. Um, obviously having, you know, having the connectivity with our academy and those young players having, you know, their, their own idols to look up to and, and that they cross path with day in and day out. Um, and so that's that's the unique part about it. And I think, you know, that's something that you can't replicate. You know, if you don't have those teams that are, you know, in your market, it's tough to really replicate that. and. Um, really have that attachment. So, you know, we're trying to do everything that we can to make sure that we have that attachment all across the board and, and build those relationships here locally with um, the youth clubs, you know, the, the other academies, um, you know, in our market to make sure that they're they're engaged with us as well. Yeah, now not only do these kids have an, an MLS club to cheer for, there's a pathway to the pros as well. And obviously with the academies and the MLS Next Pro team that you're going to be president of, moving in that direction that's you think back to when you were a rookie in this league in 2009 you know, you're playing well you came in as a rookie in 2009 and immediately played started every game all season but a lot of people in 2009 rookies were playing in the MLS Reserve League and when you think back to what the setup was like just 13 14 years ago to where we are now with the academy yeah. setup MLS Next Pro I mean how far has the league come in terms of that player development pathway and how vital is that to building the game and this league in this country. I mean, it, it's massive. It, you know, this is this is going to be a game changer. I think, um, obviously, with you know the the DA stepping out of the academy um, in 2020. You know, I think it was a gutsy move for the league to step in um, and, and build MLS Next, and it, it was the right move um, just to kind of step into that youth development space. You know, I think for the casual fan, no one knew what that pro player pathway was you know you could be in all these different leagues and there's all these different mechanisms to to get to the first team but having everything kind of owned by by mls and there being a direct pathway to the first team um just makes it simple just even just just communicating that and educating educating the fan base so for you know mls to step in and you know take on mls next you know just from a youth um, and player development standpoint um and then this year implementing mls next pro um, and really just complete that, you know, pro player pathway. It's just a huge opportunity and for players to see, you know, the steps that they need to take. Um, and also it just, just helps from uh, a management and expectation standpoint, you know, before you're having some players that, you know, they sign homegrown contracts at 16 and then they're immediately getting tossed into the first team and they're not necessarily ready. Um, and then they're in the league for, you know, two, three, four years and, you know, really have have no 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 career longevity after that so now to be able to you know take your strides um get get that player development you know get that coaching that you need from you 14s you 15s you 17s and now you 19s and now have a next pro um as an option to develop and really hone in on your craft um before making that that leap to the first team 
Um, now you have, you know, kind of five years of being in a professional environment that you're able to learn how to be a pro. You know, you got you're not not getting thrown into the wolves and, and, and fending for yourself, but you're actually been in a pro environment. And, you know, the, the, the technical staff, the first team technical staff has seen you for a number of years before actually getting into the first team. So I think it's massive. I think it's going to continue to grow, um, you know, obviously with the World Cup this year and then, you know, obviously World Cup coming to North America in 2026, you know, this is just going to be continue, continued uh, opportunities for um, investment into these leagues and continue to, to, to leverage resources to make these leagues um, exactly what we want them to be and what they need to be to continue to progress the game in, in North America. Last thing before we let you go, I know you're home in North Carolina now, but also sort of a homecoming for you this weekend, coming back to Foxborough oh, yeah. for the Revs game against Charlotte FC on Saturday night at Gillette Stadium. You mentioned off the top, is this the first time that you'll have been back at Gillette since you left the Revs in 2016? I was back there, I want to say, was it, might have been beginning of, was it end of 2020 okay. or beginning of 2021? 20, I, I came to a, I came to a match with, uh, with, with Clyde Sims. Uh, we took in a match, but um, this is going to be, you know, really, really my first time like being back boots on boots on the ground, um, actually being field level at Gillette. So looking forward to, to getting back. Um, you know, I have so many fond memories of, uh, of being in New England, um, it's really a place that that built me and made me who I am. You know, from from a boy to a man. So I have nothing but love for New England. Looking forward to being back um, and seeing all the all the great people. I'm mean, the organization that, like I said, helped me make me who I am today. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing all the fans. Uh, I'll see all you guys as well. Um, so hopefully, hopefully, it's one to remember. I know you're pretty close with Shari Joseph too. We think of Coach Shari. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh man, I got I got a chance to connect with him when uh when, when New England was down here a couple of weeks ago. You know, I'm just I'm so happy for him. You know, I think you know he he deserves it. He's he's done a fantastic job, um, just to get getting to where he's at. You know, he has so much knowledge. Obviously, his, his playing career speaks for itself, um, and I think he's going to have an even better coaching career just with all the knowledge that he has underneath those dreads up there. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing um, how his coaching career unfolds as well. Darius, how interesting is it to see former teammates of yours take different career paths and kind of where they go? Because I feel like you're a part of the same entity for so long, you know, within MLS, within the same team, whatever it might be. And then you see, uh, like, Shari is now on the Revolution coaching staff. Charlie Davies has been doing incredible things with broadcasting in his career. Just how interesting is it to see, you know, your former teammates kind of take these different paths? Yeah, I'm just so I'm so happy for everyone, you know. When you're when you're transitioning from playing, you know it's it's tough. You know you've you've had your dream job, you know, right out of college, and so pretty much anything you do after that um, is going to be be a step below. So, um, what what can you do to find that that next dream job? And just seeing how you know the different routes and you know paths that all my former teammates have taken. You know, I'm, I'm so proud. Just you know, Andrew Farrell, you know who. You no, know, I think it was was it my second or third year he came in as a rookie, and just seeing that now he's the you know New England's leader in appearances is is amazing. Um, you know, continue to follow Till Bunbury and, and his path. You know, now now in Nashville, like you said, Shari, Charlie. You know, me and Kevin Austin still keep in touch. I have a group chat with with Shari, Kevin Austin, Kano Smith, Clyde Sims, Blah Beckett, awesome. like. All of these, all these people who have helped, you know, were with me along the way. You know, the relationships are, are what you remember most, um, and, and that camaraderie with with your teammates. So, um, you know, why you want to why you want to play as long as possible? You know, you can't you can't play forever. Um, and so, it's the relationships that do really last forever, and just having those bonds with teammates, and you know, just supporting them as they continue to embark on you know their career transitions, and making sure that you know you support each other, and that you know we can do whatever we can to help each other have success once. Um, we finish. So it's, uh, it's, it's been fantastic to see, and I wish everyone the best as they transition out and take on their own post-playing careers. Darius, really appreciate you taking the time, man. So happy for all of your success. We hope for continued success except in the Saturday. future, except for Saturday night, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait to, we'll wish you good luck on, on Sunday into the future, but until then uh, we'll, we'll hold off on the uh, wishes for future success, but uh, great to see you uh, doing so much so early in your post-playing career, and we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you this weekend. See you Saturday. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Always great. See you right. Saturday, Darius. See ya. We will be back shortly to wrap up the rest of the show. Welcome back to the Far Post Podcast, presented by eSports 
Gaming League. Uh, fantastic to I have love Darius. Darius Barnett. He's yeah. just the best. Yeah, he always yeah, he was. just the best. He was just always awesome since the first day he got here. Yeah. Just pure. Yeah. Darius played every minute of every game his rookie year with the Revolution in 2009. Uh, not a bad way to start your no. professional soccer career. No. Um, and I, am, I will say I am incredibly intimidated by his resume. Yeah. His resume is... It's hard to get that on one page. Far more diversified <laughs> than mine yeah, will ever sure. be. Yeah. He has been uh, just absolutely wild in his first five years post professional playing career. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the positions that he has had, the experience he has gained. Yeah, when, when, when with the, cause dealing with him obviously through league circles, and you were talking to him first through the whole commercial partnership angles, and then it was well he's now like on the Adidas account, which is obviously one we spend a lot of time on, and then it was well now he's he's moving on to. Charlotte, you're like, oh, that's great. And now he's the president. You're like, what? Just what? <laughs> Slow yeah. down. Yeah. Awesome. I think one thing I love about him, too, is he's just always so kind and so nice, too. Um, I mean, I didn't cross paths with him in his playing career, but I met him at the he MLS. He's the very same. Yeah, I, I met him at the MLS Fashion Show uh, a couple years ago, and I didn't know anybody there, and you guys hooked me up with him just so I could have someone to say hello to, and he went out of his way to make sure that, you know, I, I wasn't alone and all of that, which was really, really nice. Um, He's just always so kind every time you speak with him. Yeah, and I think he even, did he seek you out at that event? I he remember did. reaching out to Darius and saying, hey, we've got an employee, Elizabeth, out here at this event. She doesn't know anybody out there. Do you mind, yeah, just yeah. kind of saying hello just so there's a familiar face. And then he, he not only said, of course, you know, if she finds me, I'll be a familiar face. He sought you out to make sure that you knew somebody there. He did, and I was very happy because there was a lot of people there I didn't know. And uh, don't get me wrong, I'm a social butterfly. I can go and introduce myself. But it was nice for somebody to come up and say hello and really make an effort. It made me feel uh, a part of uh, the MLS family. He's tough people. Yeah, he's the best. And he will be here this weekend in Foxborough because as we shift our focus forward, uh, it is Saturday's meeting with expansion, expansion side, Charlotte FC. Game kicks off at 7.30 p.m., at Gillette Stadium, we'd love to see you all here. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you're going to be joining us in Foxborough. Uh, but if you can't make it, it will also be available on TV 38, MyRI TV 98.5, the Sports Hub, and in Portuguese on 1260 AM, NOSA Radio USA. Uh, look, last week, we talked about going down to Miami and how that game was an inflection point. So we're past the point of inflection. Yeah. We've inflected. Uh, we're not past the point of rescue yet. <laughs> no. No. Not <laughs> but yet. And then also last week, going down to Miami, we said, you know, in addition to just going down and getting three points, would be nice to go down and really put a hurting on that team and just kind of remind people who the Revs are and get some of that confidence flowing back in the right direction. Going into this weekend's game against Charlotte FC, I just want to kind of stop. You just I just stop the bleeding. I don't care how they do it. I don't care nope. how the game ends. Just figure out a way to get three I points. I don't care stop if it's the a bleeding. triple deflected goal yeah, that VAR cares? awards to us for no reason in the 95th minute. I don't care. We need a we need a win. We just need a win. I don't care if it's ugly or pretty or spectacular. I don't care. We just need a win. Yeah, stop the bleeding. I, I think a win at home would be huge too. Like having the crowd, the atmosphere. I think that would just go a long way with regards to um, kind of changing the tune and getting the confidence back. Yeah, you got three of the next four at home. Mm -hmm. You've got Charlotte FC Saturday night. You've got Miami coming back at the end of the month for a rematch. And then you've got Columbus at the beginning of May. So with three of the next four in Foxborough, you have an opportunity here to get things turned around. And step one in getting out of this funk is making Gillette Stadium a difficult place to play again. The Revs only lost two games in Foxborough all of last year. They've now lost back-to-back -back games at Gillette, which has been unheard of for a while. And step one right now, Go out on Saturday night, make Foxborough a difficult place to play, figure out a way to get three points. Yeah. That's that. Simple as. That's that. And you mentioned the, the opponents coming up. There's two opponents they've already played. So, you know, that's recent film that you can watch and learn from. It's not like they've added pieces and all of that at that point. So um, lots of resources. You kind of know to a degree what to expect, and hopefully you can just use it to your advantage. Yeah, and what we know about the Charlotte team is that they're no slouch. This is a team coming into the season where their own head coach was saying <laughs> – <laughs> We're effed. But we are in trouble <laughs> based on where our roster stands at the beginning yep. point of the season. So credit to the Charlotte team who has come out, and they've made Bank of America Stadium a really difficult place to go and play. Th all three of their wins have been at home. Um, you know, they've gone out, and, and they've done the job at home, and I think they've kind of exceeded the very, very early expectations of where this group was at the beginning of the season. But you know with that Charlotte FC team coming in that there are some attacking pieces who can hurt you. Carol Swiderski can clearly hurt you. Mm -hmm. He's got four goals on the season. Scored twice against the Revs in that 3-1 loss uh, a few weeks ago. So 
all of a sudden this Charlotte team, having won three or four, looked a little bit different coming into Gillette Stadium on Saturday night. Yeah, I, but I think it's all it's all a factor of us looking so different. Like that's that's what's scary. That I think that's what's reframing all of this is that yeah, in 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 this sort of run of fixtures, we shouldn't be worried about an expansion team coming to Foxborough, regardless of what happened two weeks oh, ago. Of course not. We shouldn't have been worried going to Miami last week, and we shouldn't be worried about them coming here next week. But that we are, and we should be because of the way we're playing. It's about us. It's not about them. It, and I would frame that with pretty much every team we play in the league, bar a couple, that we should be the best team on the field at home. Always. Yeah. And that's what's scary. That's what's different. It's about us, and we need to get control of ourselves, um, not be dictated by whoever we're playing, especially not an expansion team. No disrespect to them, and no disrespect to what happened a couple of weeks ago. Not overlooking that, but it's about us. It's about us getting back to what makes us good. Yeah, and I'm sure that is the message within Revolution Camp right now, as it should be any time. It actually is. I delivered it earlier. Any time. <laughs> With the yeah. mail, you just like yeah. put in the mail. Uh, I, yeah, I went down there in person, just just <laughs> held just court. a piece of paper, just said it's about us. Yeah, I marched right onto the field, interrupted the train, and I delivered the message. You know, she could have Ted Lassoed it and put believe. Yeah. Something in the locker room, yep. too. <laughs> it was a direct quote from Jay Heaps. That was a big Jay Heaps ism. Oh, yes. When he, uh, every time we'd ask about any opponent. Yes. You know, well, it's really, you know, our opponent, we respect our opponent. We'll game plan for our opponent. But it's about us. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, to your point, when you're on a five-game losing streak, you better you got to figure things out in-house before you're really worrying about yeah. anything else. That's, exactly. that's the way, that's the way exactly. it is. Um, well, you know you're getting Adam Buxa back from suspension on Saturday night. He's a big addition coming back into this group. Mm -hmm. He was not on the field when the Reds played Charlotte FC a few weeks ago. Uh, he was preparing to leave to join Poland for a critical World Cup qualifier, which congratulations to Adam Buxa and Poland for qualifying for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Um, now that you get Buxa back into the mix, what are you doing on Saturday? Do you want to see this Buxa Renex partnership up top? I would love to. I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Justin's earned the, the, the right to stay on the field. Um, I, I think it would benefit both of them to have someone up there beside them. Um, yeah, I'm, sign me up. We'll see what the Revs decide to do on Saturday. We'll look for some updates later in the week as well on Brandon Bai, who was unavailable for last weekend's game. Uh, Ryan Spaulding had come in at left back with Dewan Jones shifting to right back because of Brandon Bai's absence. Uh, Ryan Spaulding then went off with an injury late in that game, so the Revs shifted to three at the back. So some questions as well in terms of the health on the back line. We'll get some updates later in the week and see how those guys are doing. But, um, uh, I mean, look, what else do you say about Saturday night? Uh, good have game, to win. Got to go out. Got to figure out a way to get three you points. Need to win. <laughs> and until until they go out and do that, that's going to be really the only – the only thing to say about every game, just go out and figure out a way to get this done because you can't you can't really get things rolling back in the right direction until you go out and get that first one. No, no, you certainly cannot. I will say too, just with training this week, uh, a little bit of a side note, but Matt Turner was involved in doing some some drills. He's moving, so like that was also a promising sign. Um, just with everything going on with him, that you know he was out there doing some goalkeeper work, which was very exciting to see. Yeah, and you hope that can be a little bit of you know a mental boost for the group as yeah. well, right? Just to see Matt back on the field, to see him back in cleats. Uh, you know, last week we saw him just doing a little bit of light jogging. Seems like he's actually getting back into a little yep. bit more of the actual goalkeeper work now. Uh, so great to see that, and hopefully that's a, a little bit of a, an emotional boost for the guys. But uh, that'll do it for this week's show, unless there's more you want to no. talk about with no. regards to, to the group right now. Wait, no. can I say something before we go? Okay. <laughs> so this is completely unrelated, but I just I know Revs fans on Twitter have been asking me, and I wanted to put on a little plug. I am running the Boston Marathon on Monday, which I'm very excited about, on April 18th. Um, and it's been a long time coming. Thank you to everybody who donated when I was raising money for the Patriots Charitable Foundation through the Revs 2 back in 2020 um, to get to this point. But I wanted to share my bib number. I have it, so you can track me if you download the BAA app. It's 17426. So you can either put in my bib number or just type in Elizabeth Pahota. That's P-E-H-O-T-A. That part might just be a little bit easier. But if you track me through there, you can kind of figure out where I am on the finish line, uh, on the on the course. Um, I'm starting at 1050. I'm going to finish sometime probably between 220 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. On the same day? I know, on the same day. <laughs> I know, I know. And if you're there, please cheer me on. Uh, send some videos, take some pictures. Uh, yeah, I, I want to see any Rose fans who are on the course. I'd love to give you a high five and come over or, or uh, wave as I'm running by if I realize too late. So and your bib number once more? It is 17426. I will reiterate my advice that I've given to you throughout the past couple of years as you have prepared to run the Boston Marathon several times and have run several other marathons in the interim. The faster you run, the quicker the race is over. So if at some point during the race you're thinking, I'm not really enjoying this experience right now, Go I'd like to be done quicker. If you run faster, the race gets done quicker, 
it's just and it's kind of like a, a long range runner's tip. Uh, yeah. I I myself am a clearly a long range you know long clearly. distance runner. Yes. Uh, which is why I call it long range running. Yes. <laughs> it's really yeah. that's how you, you know you're a really good long distance expertise runner. Expertise just dripping off. Is you. when yeah. you call it long range running. Yes. There's only like five of us who call it long range. I'm running. getting the right. expertise vibes. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> but yes, it's really exciting. So thank you everybody who supported me and uh, cheered me on, and I hope you'll continue to um, watch it all all play out finally on April 18th. Yeah, Elizabeth's running on behalf of the podcast, so I feel it's basically like. <laughs> We're all <laughs> running it. Elizabeth yep. will be there in in body, actually physically running the yeah, event. Yeah, but we're all doing it. But we're it. all yeah. kind of yeah. doing it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've all been through the whole process, the training process yeah. together. We've all been there throughout sure. the whole thing. Yeah. I've sure. liked so many of those tweets and Facebook <laughs> posts and Instagram yeah. posts. So I feel like I'm kind of part of it. Yeah, you'll be crossing that finishing line for all of us. Yeah, so. it, I will. I will, for yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, the getting up early. I'm sure you guys got up the same time I did. On uh, You guys were, you were probably watching Liverpool some of the time when I was sure. training. You know, getting yeah. up the same time to watch those oh, games. Yeah. Like, I was there. We were all in it together. Yep. I don't need I don't need the jacket and the medal, <laughs> but if I could have one or the other, would yeah. be appreciated. I'll leave it up to you. You can yeah. decide whether I get the jacket or the medal. Okay. Uh, either one is fine with me. All right, you guys can duke it out. I'll leave them on the table. The jacket's an extra small. The medal's just, I mean, it's it's probably pretty heavy. So, you know, there's pros and cons to both. You can kind of pick what you guys want. Mm. Yeah. I'll wear, I'll wear the extra small <laughs> as a pair of shorts, maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, best of luck to Elizabeth as she runs the Boston Marathon Thank you. on Monday. I know several of us will, will be there to cheer her on, uh, which is going to be a lot more enjoyable for me than actually running the marathon. Because mm -hmm. um, I've done my long range. My long range running days are in They're the past. They're over, yeah. Well, yeah. because you're injured. Because yeah. you're injured, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, that's it for this week's show. Feels Hey, feels like we're getting back <laughs> to a rhythm here, doesn't it? Well, it sure does. Feels yeah. really good. Yeah. We don't win this weekend. We're not coming back <laughs> next week, though. That's fair. <laughs> I say we'll be back next week. I, I hope. My God, I hope we're back next week talking about uh, a big New England Revolution win here in the Far Post podcast, or or a, or, a, or a narrow New England Revolution win. Yeah, well, it'd be big, any big win. in the sense that any win would be big at this yeah, point. Yeah, it would be really important. Let's fair. just settle on three points. Can we just net out of that number? We'll talk about three weeks next week on the Far Post podcast, presented by Esports Gaming.